You're listening to Bodywise. I'm Matt. I'm Kira. Kira, what's Bodywise all about? Bodywise is a chat between you and me and the rest of the Isle of Man about important things in primary care, stuff that maybe we're not talking about so much that we want to give a little bit more airtime to, Hmm. answering people's health questions Hmm. and maybe looking at things in a slightly different way. And today we're going to talk about addiction. What is it that made you want to do addiction because that was a suggestion of yours let's cover addiction Mm. Uh, addiction is something that is very prevalent uh, both on the Isle of Man and around the world but it's a really important topic to discuss I think addiction is I'm not going to say one of the last taboos in medicine but it's still something I don't think we talk enough about I think it's something that maybe we skirt around a little bit and I think it's something that's becoming increasingly prevalent so I think that addiction is something that I come across every single day in work Um, and I mean look last week we spoke about the menopause I think that's something that's being spoken about hugely but addiction is still something that hasn't quite got there yet like we're not at the stage where we're talking to our friends about addiction we're not at the stage where people are coming into us volunteering that they might be suffering from addiction it's still that thing that's unspoken about I think Do you think there's still stigma? Do you think people are still judgmental? I think it's a mixture of both. I think there is definitely a bit of shame and I think there is definitely judgment. I mean, you must see it. I mean, you work in the emergency department. Uh, I I work in in other areas as well. And I still think that there's that judgmental aspect about addiction. I think that people, when people speak about addiction, it's seen as a social problem. But actually, it's a medical issue. Yeah, it's deeper than that. Um, I mean, I, I find my uh, colleagues in the emergency department are, br- are brilliant with mm. addicts. So clearly, we see a, we see a lot of addicts there, and um, various addictions. Um, but I know what you mean. There's still work to be done. Mm. And my, my best friend, who also uh, studied on the Isle of Man and did her nursing on the Isle of Man, she has been qualified since the 80s, and she says that the the shift has been huge so far. And she remembers a time when things were, were really uncomfortable if you were an addict coming in seeking help. Mm. And I think we've we've moved massively from that. Um, but there's much, much more to be done. And I think that we're seeing things differently now here. Mm. I think there's an acceptance that, yeah, there's many forms of addiction mm. and there's many types of addicts and there mm. is problems here. Mm. What do you see here? So, I mean, look, the Isle of Man is no different from Ireland and no different from anywhere else in Europe. And I think what's interesting is that, I suppose, it's the spectrum of addictions. So, I mean, you know, the, the common things that people always talk about, obviously, alcohol and the Isle of Man is no different from Ireland in that certainly we have probably got an unhealthy relationship with alcohol and, you know, more so in the Isle of Man, Ireland, and the UK than probably our European counterparts. But there are lots of different things that people are addicted to. And that ranges from you know, teenagers and young kids that are addicted to social media, which is something we're seeing quite a lot, um, to people who are addicted or have an unhealthy relationship with drugs, sex and other things like that. So what interests me about addiction is it's a spectrum and it involves a huge amount of, of, of different facets and aspects and it affects a huge amount of people. Kira, when it comes to addiction, what are the questions you think people have around addiction? Hmm. If I tell my GP that I've got a problem with this substance... Are they going to tell the police and am I going to get a criminal record? So no. Um, the aim that we have in primary care is to help you. So the single most important and biggest step for us is for somebody to come forward for help. Uh, and our aim is to deal with the medical issues. Um, so what we try to do is to help you. Um, and first of all, to identify what the addiction is. There are multiple different levels and it ranges from a harmful relationship with a substance to abuse of a substance to dependence. So what we try to do, number one, is to figure out the nature of that dependence um, and then to help you overcome it and that that's what we aim to do but our aim is not to take the children off you to send you to prison and that's not what we're here to do our here, aim here is, 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 is to help you And can you get that help on Ireland or do you need to go away to a dedicated facility? It depends um, so in the vast vast majority of cases that can be done as an outpatient which means you do not need to go and stay anywhere to get that help done. So Kira, you've spoken um, to some people who have suffered from dependence and addiction in the past, haven't you? I have, yeah. I've I've spoken to a few people who are in recovery currently and they're going to share some of their words with us. This is Adam. 
Um, Adam lives in the north of the island and he spent a long time um, in recovery working on uh, n- numerous addictions. Okay, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll just hear a clip from Adam now. I, I went into care to start off with and um, obviously I had, I had problems so I went to see the doctor and uh, he put me on um, Valium uh, to start off with and then uh, obviously carried on from there uh, I started taking a few other stuff and um, then I went into a bit harder and then obviously I got help and sorted, sorted myself out eventually. There was just there wasn't really any help to be perfectly fair when back back then, uh, but there isn't really now. Do you know what I mean? Um, it was like underlying. I didn't know at the time, but it's like I had p- things wrong with me, and I thought it was just like a little happy happy day thing to start doing, and then realise, oh my god, I'm addicted to this, and then that's when the underlying factors come in, and and uh, then your head goes west. How do I have time to? Your drug story started with being prescribed medication to yeah, help well, you. I'd uh, I'd already started dabbling and stuff when I went when I'd been in care, been in care about a year and a half, and then I got put in with the big, the older lot, and it was just one of them things. People were taking stuff, so I started taking things, and then but I I'd had like me anger issues and stuff like that, so they sent me to the doctor and the doctor prescribed me a uh, diazepam basically and it was, wasn't supposed to be addictive then and stuff like that so do you know what I mean but obviously it is we know now it is so how do you find so you said about being in care yeah. and the culture in care for you at that time there was a lot of people taking drugs at the time yeah. how do you find breaking away from that type of culture when you live in quite a small community on a small island you, it's hard it's it, it's nearly impossible to be perfectly fair but it, you just got to try and get away from everyone and pff, basically it's like walking past someone in the street that you know for 20 years it's hard so it's like if I didn't have obviously a fiance and a baby over here I'd be in England myself but it's because it's better over there because the Isle Man's so small you're bumping into people you don't want to bump into and it's hard to get away from saying yeah and if you're a nice person do you know what I mean like I am I'll say yes to them and then you're back doing stuff that you shouldn't be doing do you know what I mean it's just such such a small place it's hard to try and get away from people that you've done stuff with have you been in rehab on the Isle of Man uh, no they should have a rehab over here but uh, I went across to the pavilion in uh, Lancashire uh, I went to a detox centre over there and it was amazing uh, I done my detox they could have done it over here. To be fair, it was just a bit of effects detox, and it was twenty days, and then uh, come back to the Isle of Man, and then oh, that problem started when I come back a little bit. You know what I mean? Because I seen the uh, same people and stuff like that, so you get dragged in slowly and slowly, more and more. It's like a stigma over here. They don't want to want to tell the problem about drugs, but it's like so rife over here people don't know how bad it is you know what I mean it's unbelievably rife you know what I mean you can go anywhere and get anything and it's and also I think when you have childhood troubles and stuff like that um, I think it leans you more towards the the addiction side of the drugs Um, some people can start taking the drug and nothing 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 but then I think because of the because of the way you've been brought up or things that have happened to you in the past people I find with people that I've had childhood trauma and stuff like that and um, they seem to get the habits they're the one they're the people that get to get the habit on the on on the drug to try and take away something that's happened in their childhood you know what I mean and then um the best thing that I could learn was triggers and um learning my triggers then taught me like what what I needed to try and sort my head out if you were in a different part of the island where maybe there were people that you didn't know. How long would it take you to access drugs and how difficult would it be? Easy, just a phone call and it's that, that, that's the problem. Do you know what I mean? It is, it's, there's a lot of people over here and people don't realise it, so you've got to try and cut yourself off and like basically hide in the house, become a hermit. So that was Adam's uh, contribution. Kira, what, what's your take-home message from that? You know, I think Adam talks really well about um, how he was impacted by adverse life events as a child. Mm. And it just reminds me as a practitioner to really look at that trauma-informed approach and 
and to remain non-judgmental. You know, it's all about what we've all got in our toolboxes. Mm. And if you've had a traumatic childhood, then your toolbox maybe isn't as full as the next person. So Mm -hmm. your coping strategies maybe aren't going to be as wide ranging. So Kira, who have you spoken to next? So next I spoke to Lucy. Um, Lucy is not her real name, um, but I've known Lucy for a while and I've watched her really grow and change and actually come through her recovery as a really strong and wise person. Okay, so we'll hear a clip from Lucy now. My journey isn't one that is particularly unique, but they were events that changed my life in every single way. I developed an addiction to legal highs and synthetic cannabis. At the height of active addiction and prior to my detox, I struggled to go more than an hour without using. My sleep pattern didn't exist uh, and I was often going days without eating food. I became unable to obtain the substance I was using and my body started withdrawal. I lost a stone in the space of a week. I couldn't regulate my mood, my emotions, and I had what I now believe to be a small seizure. It became clear to me that I would not be able to continue without support and I was struggling to conceal what was happening to me. First, I reached out to my mum and then a long time close friend. I was very lucky to have solid support and this enabled me to start what would be a very difficult and painful process. Upon the advice of a family friend, I contacted Motivate, a local addiction counselling service. I received an appointment within a week and the receptionist was understanding and kind. I spoke with the same counsellor each week and then bi-weekly and we were able to put together an extremely effective recovery plan. Having a space to talk freely about events and feelings that I was not ready to share with those close to me was instrumental in helping me to make sense of what was happening and how I could proceed forwards. I attended sessions for several months before self-electing to close my file with agreement from my counsellor. If I could say one thing to my past self before contacting Motivate, I would say, what have you got to lose? Going backwards is no longer an option if you don't want this to be the way your life is anymore. Recovery for me personally has been both a painful and beautiful transformation. I've developed and maintained healthy, positive relationships with family and friends. I love and value myself and I consider myself when I make decisions for the future. I've been able to retrain, obtain a diploma, and I found a vocation that gives me that gives me purpose. If I could say anything to someone else wondering whether to start their recovery journey and seek help, I would say do it, but be prepared to give it every single thing that you have. There are going to be moments when you don't think that you can do it, and moments when you feel euphoric at your progress. And your journey will differ from others, but find solace and support in those around you. Speak with people you trust, and trust that there are services you can access that will support you at every step. You might just surprise yourself. Thank you for listening. Wow, that was that was really powerful. So that was Lucy's contribution. I think that the take home message for me there, Kira, was just how supportive and effective Motivate has been. And certainly in my experience as a GP on the island, um, Motivate has helped a lot of people on the island um, with their addiction and helped them get through their addiction. So it was great to hear such positive feedback from somebody who's used their service in the past. Yeah, exactly. A fantastic service. Um, the last person we're going to hear from is a childhood friend of mine um, who talks about... Um, a little bit about what recovery can look like for her. She's 20 years um, of using heroin and is really coming out the other side of that. Yeah, recovery doesn't always last. I've been, you know, I've had a lot of recoveries over and over again. It's, it's a lifetime battle. It's never going to end. You're always going to have something hanging over you and there's always the fear that you'll trip. And you can never promise you'll never fall, but you can promise people you will always keep trying to get up. And that's all, what I've always said. Um, I can never promise that I'll never relapse because that's impossible. If the stress gets too much, I will. But I can promise that I will keep trying to fix it again, over and over again. And that's, that's the most you can promise realistically and, and honestly. 
We're so grateful for those who contributed and shared their story. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's so important to hear their perspective, isn't it, Kira? Yeah, yeah, I'm so grateful. Um, It's really brave, actually, to speak up, especially when you live in a small community like we do. Mm. Um, So thanks so much. So now we're going to chat to um, one of the most influential and important doctors when it comes to addiction in Ireland, uh, a a GP called and a specialist in addiction called Dr. Austin O'Carroll. Austin is the founder of a charity in Ireland called Safety Net. And Safety Net is a charity that provides medical care to those who are disadvantaged or vulnerable in society. And that includes people who suffer from addiction, uh, newly arrived migrants and people who are homeless. Um, and Austin has really changed the face of addiction and how we manage addiction in Ireland and has been to the fore in terms of moving the management of addiction out of hospitals and away from the traditional settings into the community. Uh, and what we're, we've seen with Austin's help is that addiction, whether that's alcohol addiction or whether it's addiction to drugs, is being managed more and more by GPs in the community. Uh, and as I said, Austin is somebody who has spearheaded that transition in Ireland um, and who has really been the unsung hero when it comes to providing medical help for people who are disadvantaged in Ireland. I think his perspective will be really interesting. A, a lot of what I was listening from some talks that you've given before was about um, trauma-informed approach. And I, I found that fascinating. And as a clinician, I thought, what what a great um, what a great way to approach addicts, and I wondered if you would talk a little bit more about that and what that looks like. Well, this is a long answer to your short question because the actual it sort of starts as to what do you think causes addiction, and most people think addiction is related to some internal failing on the person's part that somehow they're weak and they don't know how to make right life choices. And of course, if that was the case, that it was somehow an internal weakness, then you'd expect addiction to be spread across all the classes, though everybody would be prone to it. However, that's not the truth. Addiction is clearly associated with poverty, and poverty is associated with trauma, which I'll come on to. I do this exercise with medical students, where I ask them, I go to class of 150 medical students, and I'll often say, how many of you know someone who's got a serious drug problem to heroin or, or crack cocaine? And you might find five people put their hands up. I then say, how many of you know um, someone who's died of drug addiction? And you might find one person puts their hands up. You walk into an inner city primary school and you ask a group of eight-year-olds, how many of you know someone who's died, who, know, who has heroin addiction or died? And they put all their hands up to every single question. Because... Many people in the area, in the inner city where there's huge deprivation uh, are affected by drug addiction and many people die. I know families who've lost several children to uh, drug addiction, many families. And so poverty is the biggest, is one of the biggest single associations with, 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 with um, addiction. It is the single biggest association. And similarly, what is it about poverty that causes addiction? It's the fact that poverty is intertwined with childhood trauma. Childhood trauma, uh, there's a lot of research been done into this recently, where they find children who've experienced trauma will uh, experience a wide range of deleterious outcomes later on in life. They've identified around 10 different types of trauma, including physical, emotional or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, as well as other things such as parental separation, parental drug addiction, parental incarceration, etc. There's altogether 10. And they find the more of these adverse events you experience of childhood, the worse the outcomes in later life. So, for example, if you've had four or more adverse childhood events, you, you will probably die 20 years younger than someone who has had uh, no childhood uh, adverse childhood events. That your life expectancy is reduced by up to 20 years. Your health have, would be exposed to a far higher level of uh, chronic health conditions such as diabetes, cancer, uh, heart failure, uh, lung, uh, lung disease. You will be exposed to social problems such as unemployment. You're much likely, more likely to be unemployed. Um, you're six to seven times more likely to end up being an, uh, have an addiction. You're more likely to be incarcerated. You're more likely to be either a victim or a perpetrator of violence. You're more likely to be homeless. These are just some of the dreadful outcomes that come out from childhood trauma. So when I see addiction, and anyone who works with the addiction, it, just to go back to trauma, what they find is that trauma has actually an effect on the way the brain works. It tends to be that when you're exposed to a lot of trauma, 
you go into this fight or flight uh, thing where you're ready, you know, you're at high alert because trauma makes you scared and you're at high alert whether to run or freeze. And that means that you've got adrenaline coursing through your system. And that means you're emotionally very labile. And if you can imagine a child who's, who's raised where there's a lot of violence or abuse, they're constantly at high alert and they learn to defend themselves by an aggressive and being angry. And so this constant state of, of emotional high alert is very wearing. So those of us who work with drug addiction see um, addiction as actually self-medication for trauma. So you're taking heroin, you're taking drugs to actually regulate the emotional effects of trauma. And they're very effective at doing that, escaping from that constant high alert. Very effective in managing the addiction, but they're not a very effective life choice. They're a terrible life choice. So does that give you an understanding of, of, of why I see trauma as, as, you know, how it affects drug use? Yeah, it does. Um, I think what, what, what you're saying there is that drugs are very often used as a self-soothing um, technique for people who've had a really rough childhood and just a really bad time generally. And it sounds like perhaps these are people who could do with having more things in their toolbox but actually have have less coping strategies in their toolbox because of um, having previous neglect and, and things like that. Is that right? Have I got that right? That's exactly yes. It. Exactly. It. They're managing the, the emotional effects and then because of trauma, they don't have the... Like I was brought up as a child to learn how to... to I, I knew I was loved even when I was being given out. To, I knew I was loved even when things were going tough for me in other places. I knew I had the support of the family. Um, and they also would tell me when I was going wrong. They also learned, taught me how to... Uh, expect failure and that if I work through failure you'll get success they taught me the skills of of that if I go through a, lo- a rough time that it's normal to feel grief but it will go and there'll be someone there and that I don't need to be taking uh, substances to manage that grief it's normal when you're talking to some of the kids with the background they've, they've got this huge emotional dysregulation and they have not been taught these life skills because their parents were similarly traumatized and never learned those life skills so it makes absolute sense that they use drugs um, from their perspective, but it's just a terrible thing to happen to their lives. When I moved to the Isle of Man, um, I moved to the Isle of Man about a year ago now, and I uh, haven't come across anyone in the Isle of Man who's suffering from heroin addictions. Some people who are suffering from addiction to, to other medications like benzodiazepines. But at the other end of the, of the spectrum, Austin, I see a large number of patients who are dependent on prescription medications like codeine in particular do you think it's the same in the same factors that are driving dependence and addiction in in those patients i think i think it's similar it's not this it can be more complex um i think um you know, trauma, definitely trauma doesn't just affect people from areas of deprivation. I mean, a lot of, many people are exposed to trauma. And I think a history of trauma will make you prone to an addiction of some sort. And um, yes, I think, you know, these type of addictions, prescription addictions can be related to a history of trauma uh, as well. I think, though, there are more complex causations in those ones. For example, some people may be suffering from chronic pain. And as we know, chronic pain has both uh, physical and psychological elements to it. And um, these, you know, it's a complex interweaving of these two elements that can then lead them to become dependent on these medications. And the problem is when you become, eventually become dependent on these medications for pain relief, you're because, you know, pain is not just about pain. Pain is about the anxiety that you're going to have pain the next day. You know, so, you know, when you have pain, it's the fear of pain is as bad as the pain. Mm. So you then become not just dependent on the medication for the actual pain, but you can dependent on it for the fear of the pain. And then you get caught in that awful, you know, that awful web of um, of reliance on these medications. Mm. So I think trauma can explain some of that. But I think there are other factors that are involved in that as well. Mm. And for someone who's listening, who who thinks, you know, God, I I, I think I might be suffering from an addiction. What myself and Kira were saying is, is the first step is is to kind of approach approach your GP and and have a conversation with them. I mean, is that is is that a fair thing to ask people to do? I think the first thing, if you have you feel that you are having a, a substance problem, and and I think people often 
you know, sometimes it's the best way instead of thinking about it as an addiction, just think is the use of this substance, and this substance could be alcohol, this substance could be benzodiazepines, Valium, this substance could be heroin or cocaine. But if it's having an effect on your life, in other words, you're having rows at your friends, you're having rows at home, it's caused you to miss work, it's caused problems with your health, then you have a problem with that substance or that drug or that alcohol, mm. and you need to address it. And the thing is, don't become self-judgmental. Recognize you have a problem and talk to a professional. And a GP is your the first point to call as a professional. And they're there not to judge you and say, oh, you're wrong or there's something bad about you. They're say to, to say to you, okay, how can we help you? And to, to, to uh, get you to in touch with people. I regularly get people to, for example, who are drinking, who feel they're drinking too much alcohol to talk to alcohol counsellors. They're not addicts. They're not going to go into withdrawals if they stop the alcohol, but they've recognised that they have a problem with alcohol. And they go and talk to the, the counsellor who might spend one or two sessions with them. And that might sort out that their issue and they learn how to manage and control their alcohol consumption. For some people, it may be that their alcohol consumption or their addiction has gone so out of control, they have to stop it altogether. But have that conversation and the GP is the first point to go. Mm. And maybe if you're listening and you think, God, that sounds like my son or my daughter or my, my husband or my mother, I, I suppose a good place to start, as you were saying, is just to have that conversation with them and, and plant that seed in, in, in their mind. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I think that, you know, a true friend gives you honest feedback uh, and a true friend takes a risk, which may put the friendship at risk. But, you know, um, uh, you know, that is what and all, and it, it, you know, that is really because you're offering them an opportunity to change once you give them feedback. And when I give the feedback, rather than say, um, you know, you are or you should or you ought, because when you use those converse, those particular words, you tend to get a reaction of, well, why I should I? And you tend to get people into the they feel like the small child to be given out to. So what I always recommend is people don't say you should, say, listen, I find I get very stressed or anxious when you are drinking because I feel that you don't control your drinking. I feel that I, I, I feel nervous. Mm. Uh, or I get uncomfortable when uh, I, I, because I, 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 you know, I see you take these tablets and I've, I find it uncomfortable because I think you're more drowsy. I, I, I'm worried you're dependent on this. And so it's my concern. So you own the concern and a person can't criticize you for owning a concern, they, mm. you know, so you're not getting into that you ought or should, because that'll just, that can end up in a row going back and forth. So stick with your position. I, I'm worried about you essentially. Mm. Yeah. And it, it causes me upset. I think I think if our listeners know that we're, we're not going to be judgmental if they come in and speak to us and that we are going to consider um, what kind of trauma they might have experienced and how that's impacted on them. And also if listeners who, who don't have a problem with addiction are able to think about why their friends or their family have these issues and maybe mm. be more sympathetic from hearing the words that you're saying and be a bit more understanding and and um, less judgmental, then we can all take a pretty big leap actually in the right direction mm. to caring for people and helping them in their recovery journey. No, I, I so agree with you. Like I, I believe we should be teaching the issue of trauma to children. Mm. Um, you know, I think these, there's a lot of taboos that we should break with children. You know, if I had a child uh, access to school, I'd be teaching them about trauma-informed care. I'd be teaching them about menopause. I'd be teaching them about menstruation. I'd be teaching them about the fact that not everyone has children when they're older. Because, uh, you know, children aren't told this and that, it, you know, they, yeah. they have these unrealistic expectations of life and it causes them then to have disappointment. Do you know, so they're teach very them good at having these conversations with, aren't they? Like, I've, they got, are. I've got a nine-year-old and a three-year-old and these conversations yeah. are much easier to have with my nine-year-old than they are to have with most adults because nine-year-olds are very yeah. accepting and very realistic, I think, and take all this really in their stride. So we have some pretty full-on conversations. We've got a long, long 45-minute journey to the um, the Manx Speaking School every morning. So yeah. we get into some pretty hefty topics. Um, but I totally agree I, with you. It's great to have these conversations with children when they're younger. Just from my perspective, Austin, I think for me, the, the take-home certainly is you've completely simplified in my head I would sometimes get that patients come in to me and they, they want to find out because they've done some Googling. Is this a dependence? <coughs> Am I suffering from abuse? Am I dependent on something? Is this an addiction? 
and what you've basically explained simplifies it beautifully for me you know if you feel that you've got a problem with the substance or with the behavior and that's having an impact on your life then it's time you spoke to somebody about it and i think that's just such a simple message yeah i think if you simplify it down like that because the problem is if you want to say have i an addiction the fact of being an addict has so much stigma and so much consequences people don't want to think about that the simple thing way of thinking of it is is it affecting my life if you're finding that you're having um, physical consequences if you don't take the drug or the alcohol then you do have what we call a physical addiction so um you know but still it's it's you know don't get judgmental about it it's just that helps you understand how far down the curve you are but if you're at the you know whatever way you are the, having a problem early is the early start deal with it then however if you're further down deal with it go talk to your gp and don't be getting yourself into self-judgment about oh am i an addict mm. that's you know none of that is it's crap being honest <laughs> thank you so much austin for for coming on and talking to us i've I've really enjoyed listening to quite a few of your podcasts and your TED Talks um, over the past fortnight since Matt said we were going to have a chat with you. And it's definitely impacted on me and and changes that I'd like to make in my care for people. So thanks so much for giving us this time. Thank you so, so much for giving us your valuable time. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. I now want to visit the Isle of Man and meet everyone over there. Oh so my gosh, please come. I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring the bike with me. I'm looking forward to it. I'll definitely do that sometime over the next six months. That'll be brilliant. So Kira, that is a wrap on the third episode of Bodywise where we talk about addiction. Um, certainly for me, the message I'd like to get across is if you are suffering from addiction in silence, chat to your GP or nurse and they will guide you um, to, to help. What was your take-home message, Kira? Um, so, yeah, please, absolutely, if if you're having a bad time with substances um, or with any addictions, please speak to us. Um, we we want to help. That's that's why we do what we do. Next week, we're going to be talking about depression. So if you have any questions, Kira, where can you send those questions? Send those through to bodywise at manxradio.com. Any questions that you've got about depression, um, f- about yourself and depression or family members or anyone you might be worried about. And we're also going to cover in future weeks the topics of teen health and dementia. So if you have any questions on those topics either, Kira, give us that email address again. You can send them through to bodywise at manxradio.com. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.